I don't know that this happened, so I'll confess up front that it may not have happened, but it might have. Back in the days long ago, in downtown Wichita, when Old Town was downtown, the Chisholm Trail was still active, and a Texan was walking up Douglas Avenue, might not have been named that then, wearing his splotched cowboy boots and walking past the Smith shop. And as the smithy is working on a horseshoe, holding it with his tongs and beating it on the anvil with his hammer, it slipped from the tongs and flew out red hot into the street in front of the Texan. The Texan reached down and picked it up and quickly threw it down. And the smithy, smiling, said, kind of hot, huh? And the Texan said, no, this don't take a Texan long to examine a horseshoe. <laughs> but there are some things that one just shouldn't touch, wouldn't you say? Like a hot horseshoe, a glowing flame. Every mama who had gas heat for sure in a stove or even a wood-burning stove has warned children, don't touch the stove, don't put your hand in the flame. You actually only have to experience that one time, do you not, until you tell yourself, don't touch that because that's going to hurt. There are other things that need to be avoided, and it just makes sense that we would avoid them. And yet some people make the mistake of failing to use better judgment, or they're distracted, and, or they are drawn to something like the moth to the flame, almost, as it were. You hear once in a while. You hear someone walking into a moving propeller of an airplane, and you think, why would you do that? Don't go there. But on the other hand, there are people who do things in life that are just for sure to cause calamity, if not right then, eventually. And they take terrible risk, inappropriate risk. They do that in recreation, they do that at work, and sometimes that even happens in the field of religion as well. We do that sometimes in moral character, in our habits, the places we go, the people with whom we spend time, the things we consume, sniff and dip and, you know, the process. Don't touch that. Don't go there is the more common way we say that in these days. And the scripture gives instructions along that line. The Old Testament, of course, has got a lot of thou shalt nots. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't go there. Thou shalt nots. That's the same thing as don't touch. Just don't ever participate. Don't even contemplate. Don't let that be something that's in your resume whatsoever. Just avoid it. The first thing that I think of in terms of New Testament instruction is one that, that seems to be kind of a catch-all, and that's in 1 Thessalonians 5, whenever verse 22, I believe, is the passage, where the Apostle Paul said when he's, he's been giving a list of the kinds of things that people who are Christians ought to do and which will, in doing, display that they are Christians. Finally, in verse 22, he just very succinctly said, avoid even the appearance of evil. Avoid it. Don't go there. If something might seem, might be by someone else perceived to be evil, sin. Don't go there. Don't involve yourself in it. That's the better 
And the safer case is just stay entirely away, avoiding any possibility of being associated with that. Being able to stay away from evil. In a world like the one where we live, sometimes there's quite a contest. It's difficult indeed. Sometimes supporting things that, that in fact aren't good is hard to avoid because we get pulled in. It's cultural. It's things that people do and we feel prone to want to be a part of what people do. And so we find ourselves there. We find ourselves supporting those things. I found a quotation from an interesting character that uh, you probably remember, but maybe not someone whom you thought of in the last three days. His name Jesse Ventura. Now, he's got a resume. Jesse Ventura that uh, was an actor, a TV personality. He was in Vietnam uh, from 19... I don't remember the dates exactly, but three or five years. And then when he came back into the United States and found his place in life after the war experience, he became what we know him best for, a professional wrestler. And then, from being a professional wrestler, he, as it were, jumped out of that ring into another, and he ran for governor of the state of Minnesota, and is the only person with the Reform Party anywhere in any state in the United States who ever has won the governor's office though after being elected, he changed to the Green Party. This individual is quoted as having said, any time you accept the lesser of two evils, you still have accepted evil. That's a worthy observation, isn't it? When you accept what you consider to be the lesser evil, you still selected evil. And some people might say, we get into some circumstances where that's the only choice that you have. And here we are looking at a passage in the New Testament that observes the fact that we ought to avoid the very appearance of evil. That we don't have to be partaker, participant in any of that in any form. And so it sets us aside. It makes us different and distinct. But if you're defining Christianity, if you're trying to say, how does a Christian behave? What's his moral character? What's his behavior? If you can do it without suggesting that he's different, that he's distinct, and that he has lines that he doesn't cross in terms of moral behavior, in terms of biblical doctrine, wherever you want to apply it, there are points at which our instruction is don't touch that. Just don't go there at all. Now, of course, while the scriptures teach us those things very clearly, Satan has a way of kind of dressing up evil. And with the dressing that he puts on it, to give us the kind of rationalization of massaging it a little bit and trying to make it seem palatable and okay. That we can, we can touch it a little bit, just don't get totally sucked into it in regard to our behavior, our moral principles. He can cause us to decide that maybe things that are contrary to what the scriptures say are not entirely wrong, and that it's better to be a little bit right, even with ethics. He dresses it so that people can believe that unethical things are still going to be okay, because, because, because. And those becauses seem to be supplied in order that we can do something and that, that is wrong and it still be okay. But we know, and here's where we need always 
to start and to end. We know that wrong is wrong, no matter how it's couched, no matter how well-dressed it is, and all kinds of rationalizations and excuses, it still can be pretty as anything you ever saw, but wrong is still wrong. That's a hard, hard lesson in the society in which we live. There was, on the internet this morning, a story about a pastor in a Presbyterian church in, I'll just go ahead and say it, in Weed, California. I just don't, I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of good people in Weed. But I'd rather not go around saying I'm from weed because weed means different things to different people these days, does it not? But the gentleman lost his job because he put on the marquee for the church, and I don't touch this one out here on the wall. If you see something you don't like there, I didn't, I didn't put it there. I don't touch that. But he put up there that wrong is wrong. And he said that society changes, but Jesus doesn't. He gave an example, but his conclusion was wrong is wrong. And while the mores of a society may change, Jesus does not. And the report was that every family in that church said they'd leave unless he left. All but one family. Somebody said, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. But he decided that he should leave. I'm not meaning to point anything particular at that church in that circumstance because they're not that rare. They're not that different. The culture of our society has become such that what is wrong is often counted as right. But if it's wrong, if it's wrong according to God's ways and God's teaching, it's still wrong when, for instance, it's conceived or perceived by people as being something that has an ultimate good. The fact that something's done in the name of good, as something is done in the name of a cause that seems to have a good purpose, doesn't mean that you can massage it and change it so that lawlessness, that is, that what you see, what, what violates what God says is lawlessness, and lawlessness is sin. That's how it's defined in First John chapter 3 and verse 4. Lawlessness is sin. If God said do this or don't do this and we violate that, that's lawlessness, it's sin. And no matter how you couch it, the situation, ethics of the circumstance does not make it right. By situation ethics, I refer to a philosophy that has been very, very popular in our culture for a long time. And that says that there is no such thing as wrong and right. There's no absolutes, but everything is kind of relative to the circumstances. And you look at the circumstances in which this all is occurring, and then from the circumstances in which it's couched, then you have to measure each time, would this be right or would this be wrong? And should I participate? And after all, that suggests that the end justifies the means. If it looks like good ultimately comes out of it, then why wouldn't it be okay? Well, bottom line, is wrong. Don't touch that. Don't go there. You see, who we are is really what we are in our heart. That's, that's what all evolves is what's in our heart. The scriptures teach that. Jesus teaches that so very clearly. If in our heart we know that this is something that God in his word has taught, then don't touch it. Don't be drawn into it. And if you're drawn to a circumstance where you have to make a hard decision, make the right decision. I've been in civic clubs, for instance, that would sometimes want to do something good for someone. 
but the means of raising the funds to do it were inappropriate for me to endorse or to be a part of. Or they wanted to join some religious group who were themselves sponsoring something that would help the poor or the needy. But for me to be involved in what my civic group was doing, I had to do it in the stage of supporting the religious group that I knew did not teach truth about salvation and seemed to approve what they were doing, although the good could not be denied that would come from it. One has to realize I can't support that which is not right. It is the appearance of evil and the appearance of having endorsed what is there. You say, but what do you do? You find a way to accomplish the same good without supporting that which should not be touched. And in so doing, maintain your own moral integrity you're not avoiding helping the poor or whatever that need is. And the same good is accomplished. It's just that those who teach error are not endorsed and have the benefit of your seeming endorsement. Just don't go there. The conscience doesn't have to be involved, nor does the business of explaining or rationalizing have to be involved. I can't always do things, and I hope that you have lines that are drawn where you can't also do everything that others commonly accept. We don't touch it just because other people commonly accept the practice as being something that's right. There are so many applications of this that it's almost dangerous to pick one because there are other very, very strong ones that ought also to be mentioned. But I think of Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2, where the Lord said, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. One of the things that young people, and I'm not picking on them, because their adults use the same kind of rationalization, but when they want to go somewhere, that's questionable where things are going to happen that they don't need to be a part of. And by being there, they might seem to be approving, avoid the very appearance of evil. Remember that scripture? By being there, they would be perceived by others to be endorsing it, and parents say, I don't think you ought to go. And they say, but everybody else is going. Well, there's never been anywhere that everybody else went. Never has been. And parents say, well, who is going? And they list this, this, this. Sometimes it's a Christian young person who doesn't want to be left out. We, we're social. We want to be part of the crowd and be involved. And he's even able to list all the other people at church that are his contemporary. They're all going. It's hard for parents at that point. But if uh, the list of everybody's going, never included any of the other people with whom he goes to church. If all the parents stuck together, or if better, all the young people just knew already, I don't touch that, and didn't ask to go. Think what a difference that would be for everyone. The fact that it's very popular and that everybody seems to be doing it does not prove at all that it's right. Not at all. That's not proof. But it does apply a great deal of pressure upon the individual. One could study from Proverbs chapter 4 through 6, if you wanted, the advice of the father to the son in those passages have so many applications to sexual life and, and following crowds and being involved and getting drawn into gangs and all those kinds of things. Just don't go there. Don't touch is the safe way. And yet, popularity often causes us to not want to be the only one. And people say, well, no one will ever know. 
in a thousand years from now, it won't make any difference. See the rationalization that Satan provides. And, and what's the difference and what will be the consequence? And maybe you can't tell for sure. But there's that passage that's also in the Old Testament in Numbers 32 and verse 23, where Moses is talking with those, and maybe it's Joshua at that point would be rather than Moses, talking with those uh, people who wished to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan River when the children of Israel would enter into the promised land. The tribes of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh said, we like it well over here. We don't, we don't want to go across the Jordan River. And the leaders said, well, all right, you can stay here, except you have to go over and help us win the rest of it. And if you don't do that, be sure of this one thing. Here's an eternal principle. Your sins will find you out. When we sin in secret, it is really, really difficult for it to not ever come out. Your sins will find you out. They, it comes out in the strangest ways. Someone who saw us there, someone who participated, will say to the wrong person, and it's found out. Or the consequences become evident. When young people are engaged in premarital sex, there are ways sometimes that's found out and becomes so clear it can't be denied. When they take part in doping and that kind of thing and binging alcohol, there are consequences that sometimes reveal it very soon maybe a trip to the emergency room or to the morgue might prove it. But you can't hide sin. I heard a preacher say once that trying to sin and cover it up is like stealing corn and burying it. It's going to come out and your sin will be found. Don't go there. Don't touch that. And then you never have to be concerned. And even if it is something that your conscience would approve and it doesn't bother you at all to do it, you still need to be careful that your conscience is properly trained and then that you're true to your conscience. The Apostle Paul in Acts 23, we studied a while back, was able to stand before the Sanhedrin court and admit, I've been a murderer I gave my approval when somebody was murdered. And I fought against the cause of Jesus Christ. He would admit that, but he'd said, I have kept my conscience clean all my life. Everything I've ever done, I thought I was doing the right thing. But boy, he was wrong. To fight against Jesus, fight against the cause and the plan of God, kill Christians, how absurd to say I did that all with a clear conscience. But his having a clear conscience didn't make what he did right whatsoever. Try to explain that to Stephen, whose stoning he approved in Acts chapter 7. You have to deal, we have to deal with the consequences of what we do Proverbs said twice in chapter 14, verse 12, and 16, verse 25, there's a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is death. It leads down to Sheol, to death. So consider the end and make sure the conscience you follow is one that's properly trained and if your conscience is properly trained and it says that's wrong, don't touch. Just don't get engaged or involved in it whatsoever. And then don't touch even if you know that other people are doing lots of things that are very much worse than what I'm considering. See how we rationalize that? I think this is worse than this. 
and I'm going to do this. So there are a lot of people who are doing things worse than what I'm doing. And so what's the difference? Surely it will be okay to do this because this other over here is so bad. I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus talked about judgment and about apparently well-intended people who didn't teach the truth and never did the things that he said to do to be part of his kingdom, but they kind of joined up or they assumed an identity, and now they're trying to justify what they did. And he said in verse 21 and following that not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's the standard. He said, in that day, we take it, he's talking about judgment. In that day, many will say unto me, did we not cast out demons in thy name? Did we not preach in thy name? Did we not do many mighty wonders in thy name? And I will say unto them, he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You weren't doing what I said. You were somewhere close to it, maybe. You assumed the identity, but I didn't give you the prerogative to assume identity. It's my church. It's my gospel. It's my message. And it's my power. And so don't approve assuming that you can be the one who decides what happens when it happens. Follow me. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Even to this end have we been called, because Christ Jesus also suffered and died, leaving us an example that we should walk in his footsteps. John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. When people come up with substitute religions, when they come up with substitute doctrines, when they come up with things that change what you've always known that's in the Scripture, whenever they come up with easy, quick ways of getting salvation without being obedient to what the gospel says, don't touch that. That'll hurt you. It might eventually damn your soul. And indeed, there are people who do worse than what you might be doing. But that's not the standard. The standard is what did Jesus do? Paul, in writing the church in Corinth, talked about that concept as he, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. He said, I, I don't want to be numbered among those people who judge themselves by themselves Judging themselves by themselves, they commend themselves. But he said, in so doing, they were without understanding. When I say I'm better than he is and better than he is, I'm doing better than this one and that one, I must be okay. I'm not using the right standard. Jesus is the standard. Am I doing what Jesus did? Am I doing what he would do? If he were in the same circumstance, am I doing what he wants me to do? I'm not looking for justification. I'm looking for endorsement from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he spoke of those to whom he'll say, enter into the joys of the Lord prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And they are described as the faithful servants. And if it's not something I can do, endorse, support, participate in, be seen doing, or tell people I went to or did, I shouldn't touch it. Because someday I'll give an account of everything I've done in the body, whether it's good or evil. If this morning there's sin in your life, if you've been trying to massage and rationalize some behaviors. If you're doing some things, taking some things, drinking some things, engaging in some things, you know you wouldn't find Jesus doing. I urge you, 
examine that closer. Don't touch it anymore. And if you need to repent of sin in your life and have us pray with you that God would give you the strength to overcome it, I don't know how many times I've had someone say, I said I wouldn't do it, I said I wouldn't do it, and I'm doing it again. I need prayer again. We never wear out prayer. We never wear out the grace of God, nor the power of God to help us. And we want to help you if you need help and whatever it is. You may or may not want to tell us what it is. If you need help, we'll pray with you about it. If you're one who's never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and maybe you're thinking, well, I, I think I'll just, I'll just coast a while yet. I, I'm going to take my chances on this for a while. Don't, don't go there. Don't touch that. That's very, very dangerous. For what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a little time and then passes away. Take advantage of the opportunity, and if you need to respond for any reason, while we're standing and singing this song, we encourage you to come right now.